last session before lunch. Let's see what we can do here. So, hi, I'm Philip. Let's talk about Log4Shell, if you still remember that one. Who remembers Log4Shell? OK, quite a few. Good, you came to the right talk. Um, I think that's pretty much the idea what we all had before Christmas, that um, we want to have a nice, quiet Christmas, and then Log4Shell came along, and then things got more complicated. Um, just to make the interaction a little easier, because the room is so large, um, Please all get your phone out and head to slido.com because I, want, I have two questions for you. First, um, what logger are you using, just to, to get the idea? Um, and then I'll also ask about if you were affected about log4j and you can, or log4shell, and you can answer anonymously because nobody wants to raise their hand, I know that. Um, also, if you have any questions throughout this talk, um, you can just put them on Slido, and I'll come back to that every now and then to see if there are any questions, um, because it might be easier than shouting. So, let's see. I can see that most of you were lucky by using Logback, um, but we still have a good amount of people um, using Log4j at some point. Um, cool. Everybody done voting? OK, Log4j is winning or losing, or I don't know what to call it. Um, but there seems to be some activity here. So um, thanks for that. Let's switch over to were you affected by Log4j, yes or no. And you can answer anonymously, um, so nobody knows, because the raising hand thing is always like nobody wants to do that in public. Um, Cool. So I see we have a lot of experts here. Um, I'll come back to the questions. If you have any questions, just pop them, pop them into Slido, and I'll return to those and answer them as we go along. Um, so I will break that down into four parts, basically. Um, what is Log4Shell? How can you exploit it? How can an affected product look like, and how can you protect against it? And we'll do a slick Slido questions at the end of every block, so we can kind of like keep up and keep everything organized. Um, why am I talking about that? I work for Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch. We have Log4j2 built into our products, um, and we've had a very fun December with that. So I spent a good amount of time on that, so that's why I thought that's do a recap or a retrospect and see how it was for everybody. So what is Log4Shell for those who have not seen that before? Um, it started off very innocent and people didn't pay attention for the first few hours. I think it came out the Thursday evening in, in Europe and Friday morning people were still looking at it until they figured out how bad it was. It's in Log4J2, um, a very high severity security issue, so these are the relevant links for that and it affected any version that was out at that point that was more or less recent, so any Log4J2 um, version, um, down to the latest, including all the, the different JDK versions. Um, and uh, the background behind that is um, JNDI, or some call it Jindi, uh, the Java Naming and Directory interface that actually opens up this attack vector. And this slide deck here is back from 2016 from Black Hat when somebody looked at Java and said like, this Jindy thing looks really interesting for attack vectors. And then it went dormant and everybody forgot about it. But the, the idea is you have your application and you have this Jindy interface and it can do a lookup of some dynamic values. So it could look up, I don't know, you could enrich something in your application or you could look something up. So it's just a dynamo, dynamic lookup of some information. And that is always relevant or interesting for security issues. Um, and then Log4Shell broke, which basically looked like this, that I do a Jindy lookup. And then rather than just looking up a value, I could look up some code and then just deserialize it and run it. So that led to a remote code execution through deserialization. Um, with the maximum vulnerability score that you could have. And the attack vector is just like, you need to throw something like this into your logger to call the remote code, and that's really all there is, and then that remote code will be executed. Um, so to have a slightly more graphical representation of what all of this does or how it looks like, um, so you have, oh, let me, let me use my mouse here. Um, so you have 
log4j as the logger, and the data comes into the logger, and then the log layout defines how your log file should look like, and then it appends and writes it out to the destination, a file, for example. And as one of the features of log4j, it has these lookup plugins, and you can provide the name of what the lookup plugin is, and then the, the name of the value where to locate it. So for example, you could look up the Java version, which might be handy for logging to say like, oh, this crashed on that Java version. So it kind of makes sense. Um, given Jindy, it suddenly got more interesting because now you can say Jindy and then the location from where you want to retrieve a value. But the value is actually potentially a Java class executing some other code. And that's exactly what happens when you um, use this uh, vulnerability, is that you go to a malicious LDAP server under the control of an attacker. That one gives you some bad code that you then run, and then that can running code can do other connections, can load more code and do whatever you want in your, or whatever they want in your application. So that's kind of where you, you hit that boom, so that somebody logs a value that reaches out to their LDAP server to fetch some malicious code. Um, you deserialize it and run it in your application, and then you potentially have a reverse shell or whatever other thing to actually do anything they want on your server. Um, However, maybe we should just frame it a bit more positively and say not it's an arbitrary code execution, but it's a surprise extension API. That's pretty much what LDAP has been giving you here. Um, it was maybe not the right kind of surprise last December, but it is kind of a surprise API extension. Um, and because I have been mentioning the CVSS score, um, this is kind of like the de facto standard of how vulnerabilities are rated, and they have three groups. They have the basic group. They are always the same, so once you evaluate the vulnerability, this should always be the same, unless you learn new things. Um, you have a temporal group, which changes over time, for example, if there is a, an exploit out there. And then you have environmental metrics, um, where you could say, like, in my environment, um, this is handled differently. So this is not part of the official score. This is just like a thing that could mitigate it in your environment. Um, the most common thing, or what the, the score is generally based on, is here, for example, where you have the attack vector. Can I re exploit it remotely, um, or do I need to have local access to the system? Do I need to have an existing user account on the system, or can I just exploit it anonymous, anonymous, anonymously? Um, and do I need user interaction for the exploit to work or not? And log for shell kind of ticked all the boxes, so this gave you a clean 10 of 10 vulnerability here in that score. Um, as bad or good for attackers as it gets. Um, so the solution was to, to upgrade log4j, and because um, log4j still supports JDK 6 and 7, and then you need to use older versions, so for JDK 7, um, you need to update to log4j 2.12.4, whereas for 8 plus, you could go to 15, though that has another vulnerability, and we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so you should go at least to 16, but 17.1 would be the recommended one, and we'll get to why in a moment. Um, and the other thing that I guess we learned, and many of you probably also learned, that all security or most security scanners are not that great. Um, who has been fighting security scanners a lot? Okay, that's quite a few. So. The thing is, as soon as an exploit is a bit more complex, um, it needs a bit more um, smart in the scanner than most exposed. So for example, since log4j 2.10, you have that option, format message no lookups true, which basically closes the door against a lot of these vulnerabilities. But most scanners don't look for that. They just check, do you have a vulnerable version of the, the library in your code base? And if that's a yes, then it will just say, like, you're vulnerable, um, even though you might have mitigated it by that. Um, some of the attack vectors also depend on specific JDK versions and their configurations. Um, or, for example, what some, including us, have been doing, you can just remove the JNDI lookup class from the library. So you are actually close the door for that attack vector. But the security scanners don't most of them don't notice any of that, and they will just scream like you're vulnerable even though you might not be. And then you have, need to have long discussions, which is a bit annoying. Um, so that was the first vulnerability. 
But log4j um, was not that simple. It wouldn't just go away. Um, there was another vulnerability in it. Um, so like in Groundhog Day, we had to start over. This one um, happened because the patch was incomplete that was the first one. Um, at first, it got a CVSS score of 3.7 because it was only a limited denial of service attack. But later, it was updated to a limited remote code execution. So it's not as bad, but it's still a remote code execution to some degree. Um, what you had to do is you needed two things. So first, the attack vector needed to change from attacker.com because that would, have, would be blocked, but that the patch only allows lookups on localhost. But you could trick that matching of what is a local lookup by saying 127.0.0.1 is a localhost, but then you can still pop in the remote server here and the patch wouldn't pick up on that. The other thing that you need is that you need to use a non-default logging pattern. So you will need to have this context and then something that, for example, is tainted, uh, that we call tainted here. And then we put whatever thing um, into that value. And if you log such a statement from here and po put it into something that is context, whatever you called it, um, then you would still be vulnerable to that. So this depended on the logging pattern as well, and it's a non-default pattern. So it would be a much more limited attack, but it would still be a remote code execution. Um, so people looked or upgraded to the next Log4j version that came out, um, or they removed the JNDI lookup class, just as in the previous exploit. This one would also be closed by removing that lookup class in Log4j because no JNDI lookup class, no exploit through the JNDI, um, which kind of puts you in that fun situation where um, it's a stupid hack, but it's kind of a working hack for these two um, vulnerabilities. Um, so it's kind of like, let's say, honest work to stop the exploit. Um, however, we're not done. There was a third security issue. So this one keeps on giving. Um, this one um, has now a non-default pattern is needed. So this is only giving you a denial of service attack. And again, another log4j version came out. But this one is much more limited, no remote code execution. And again, you needed a non-default pattern to actually use that. Um, what was interesting, what the, the reason was, because they had recursive substitutions in lookups. And I have no idea if anybody really uses recursive lookups in the pattern lookup of log4j. Um, but that was the reason. And they simply got rid of that to close any such issues once and for all. However, this was not the last security issue. There was one more. So in, in, in sum, there were four security issues in log4j in like the span of like two and a half weeks or so. Um, this one was even more specific. It was a remote code execution, but it needed a as an attacker, you would need to own or be able to edit the configuration file and create the malicious JDBC connection. And through that, you could exploit code or exploit that. It got a much lower score because the attacker needs to actually be able to edit the log file or the, log, the pattern file on the server. And once you can edit the pattern file on the server, probably you have been pretty much owned anyway. So an attacker is not necessarily gaining so much from that. Um, but that led to large discussions um, because some people were like, well, if you can edit files on the server, it's not much of a vulnerability anymore anyway. Whereas others were like, well, it's still a remote code execution. And you then kept having these um, fun discussions about agreeing on how severe that one was. Um, and then you basically had to wait for an attacker to have access to that file to exploit that. So this one, I think, is like, interesting or an interesting gadget, um, but it has a lot of dependencies on other security issues to actually be useful in your application. So that one is not so much of a concern, probably. So to wrap this point basically up is like, I think part of the discussion here is like, how many features should a logger have? Because the, the problem of, of log4j was that it had a lot of features that many people were actually not aware of or using. And they were actually the ones biting you, and then you had the security issue. And Logback, for example, is kind of proud to have a lot of these features not, and then not having these classes of security issues. So that's kind of like the, the big discussion point, like how many features should your logging library have or not have? Um, and by the way, the Log4Gel logo changed over time. 
they made it progressively worse every time a new vulnerability was found. And this was the final one they came up with. Um, so if there was another lock for shell vulnerability, the logo would get even worse than this. So were there any questions on Slido? Yes, Logstash uses Log4j as well. And that is, uh, let me come back to that. I'll go over like how Elasticsearch uses Log4j too, because that is the simpler story. Logstash is even more complicated than that. But I'll get back to that in the kind of like the third section of this talk when I'm talking about like how it detects uh, our products. Um, has there been any actual attack attempts using Log4J that you know of? Um, I mean, yeah, like just in our own server logs, we've probably seen tens of thousands. So people were randomly scanning all kinds of things. And we'll, we'll look at the practical attack vector um, in a moment. And I'll mention then where you see them or, or how they, they come together. But let's go to the next point and answer that question there. So how can you exploit it? Um, so one thing that you can run is this GitHub repository here um, where there is a vulnerable application and it describes how to actually run it. I'll just quickly show you how this works. So the, the thing they were doing here is they're using Spring Boot. What is the logger in Spring Boot by default? Logback. Um, so it's not vulnerable. But here in this um, implementation, they added the log4j Spring Boot starter. So this one switched explicitly to log4j2 to actually be vulnerable. Otherwise, your Spring Boot applications would be not vulnerable, at least from Spring Boot itself. Um, and then the only thing that is happening in the code here is um, we have our, our Hello World logger. And then we are, for example, logging that uh, HTTP header X API version. Um, and we're adding that to a log statement. And that is really all that is needed for that attack. So now, if an attacker wanted to exploit that, they would need to run a request that puts into X API version, the chain, the I lookup, whatever LLAP server they are running. And that would then fetch the class, execute it, and then you're exploited. So that's basically what is happening. Um, and when you look at the server logs, if you have the right kind of logging enabled, and you see what attack vectors um, people tried, they would just try to throw their JNDI lookups in any kind of HTTP header that they could find. Because a lot of applications log some kind of HTTP header or some other information there. So people were just trying to brute force all over the place what are common HTTP headers what, that could be logged. And we're just throwing their attacks into that. So you could see a lot of that activity on all kinds of applications. Um, and then to actually exploit that, what you would need to run, or if you have the, the vulnerable application, you would need to run an, a JNDI server that you could connect to. Then you can run that curl command. Here I'm just running that against the, the server where that is running. Um, I add that header. So here I pop in that exploit basis or where to fetch the code from to run it. And then what you would see in that example is that uh, that this creates a new file in the file system. So it has taken over the application and can do whatever it wants. So what you basically need is you find the vulnerable application. You run your LDAP server with the exploit. Um, and then you push it into that with curl. And then you exploit it. Um, at Initially, when Log4Shell came out, there was a lot of discussion like, will there be a virus or worm around Log4Shell? Was there a virus or worm? No. Why not? Because it's, it's very application specific, because it really depends on what you're logging. So in my application, I'm logging X API version. But in another application, it could be a totally different header. So it's not a single attack vector that you could exploit and automate, but you would need to figure out what is actually being logged and exploitable on this specific system. So it's pretty system specific. Um, that's why there is no automated virus to actually scan the entire internet and exploit everything that is exposed. Because there is still this variability in like what is actually being logged in the application. That's why there was no automated exploitation to that. Um, any additional questions so far? How many releases you were forced to do because of Log4j? Um, so for our stack, 
I'll get to that in the next um, uh, section. I'll show you how, we how many times we've released, but we've had to do a couple of releases, it's true. Um, however, we have also done various mitigation steps, so it's a bit more complicated than that, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so, how can it can, can affect the product? And since my heart is closest to Elasticsearch and I've been deeply involved in that, um, let me show you what that actually meant in terms of Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch since 5.0, which was released in 2016, if I remember correctly, so basically since forever, Elasticsearch has shipped with a, with a vulnerable Log4j2 version. But it's actually not that simple how exploitable that is. Let me show you. Um, I made this table to show, based on the Elasticsearch version, which, so based on the Elasticsearch version, which Log4j version is built in, and then the exploitability still depends on the JDK because it does allow some lookups or serializations, and depending on the, the Java version and others not. So if you were using JDK 7, which was the latest version when Log4Shell came out, um, in no combination did you have a remote code execution. You had in early versions, if you were using a, a non-default JDK, so a version below 9, you had an information leak, and I'll show you why you only had an information leak and not a remote code execution in a moment. Um, so for any other version, the, the Java security manager protected you in general against the remote code execution. Um, and you could block any information leak. So an information leak could be your server triggers a DNS lookup, and you run that against the domain of an, or the, the attacker runs that against the domain under their control, and they, they lock the, the subdomain, for example, and then you push little pieces of information into that subdomain, and that, that is like an exfiltration vector that you could use. So for example, you could, if you find a, if you had like some password or whatever on the server, you could just put that into the subdomain of a DNS request, and that way you could exfiltrate the information. So that was possible with a, an older JDK version, um, though we are by now shipping newer JDK versions in all, JDK, uh, in all our binaries, so that shouldn't really hit you. Um, and there you would have needed to set that format message lookups um, to true to actually avoid that. Um, but we did, so we, we re so coming back to the question, how many times did we release? So we did, this release here, where we removed the JNDI lookup class and set this other, um, the, the format message no lookups true, this closed the first and the second vulnerability already. However, because the security scanners kept screaming at us and support was overwhelmed by support requests, we had to update um, JD, uh, Log4j pretty quickly. Um, so we had another patch release um, where we went straight to 2.17.0. So we skipped the vulnerable 2.15 and 2.16 versions actually, and went straight to 2.17. And once um, 2.17.1 of Log4j came out, we added that as well. Um, and since then, everything should be officially closed and no scanners should be screaming anymore. Um, but so basically we did one, two, three security updates because of Log4Shell, um, which was not so much fun, but it had to be done. So if you were using an older version of Elasticsearch, you still only had an information leak um, with older JDK versions, um, and it was the same mitigation applied with format message no lookups because the Java security manager protected you again. And then we did the, the, patch, the same patch level dance that we did with 7.x. 5.x, which is no longer supported and there's, there are no security updates, unfortunately doesn't use the security manager as strictly as our later versions, and there you had a remote code execution. Um, so in any version there you have a remote code execution, since, or for the later ones where we updated log4j to a l version later than 2.10, there you can set that no mes uh, format message, no lookups true, for all the versions here, this option doesn't even exist yet. There, our recommendation would be to remove the JNDI lookup class from the jar, um, which is a bit of a hack, but that's the only thing you can do. And even all the versions are actually not vulnerable because they were stuck on Log4j1. Um, so there, an old version would actually protect you. Um, and now the question is, do you know the Log4j version and JDK of all your dependencies, especially if it's a data store like Elasticsearch? 
which probably gives you quite a large attack vector in your organization because there are so many JDK applications running and very few people really know all the, the Log4j versions that they have in production. Um, and the same then applies on Docker because they probably ship their own JDK version that you don't even know of. So it's kind of very hard to have the overview of where, what is happening where. Um, so you can, by the way, in Elasticsearch, check that quite easily, um, just to give you the idea, since I have that open here. So here, if I run this command, it will tell me what is the JDK version of this, uh, of this server running. So you can just query it at runtime um, to see, and you can see I use OpenJDK um, 18, actually, here from Oracle, because we always ship the latest JDK in Elasticsearch. Um, And the Java Security Manager very much saved our bacon here. Um, unfortunately, it was deprecated in JDK 17 and is a no-op, I think, in Java 18 by now. Um, the JEP for that is 4.11. Um, we are working on mitigating that by using better modular, modularization with JPMS. Um, but it is a bit of an, an ongoing battle and not fully resolved yet. So unfortunately, the removal of the Java Security Manager is a bit of a pain point for us. Who is using the Java Security Manager? OK, that's, that's what I normally see. Um, so the Java Security Manager is not the easiest thing to use, and that's why it's not so widely used. It can, however, do great stuff. So what we have in our security policy, so security policy is what you configure in the Java Security Manager. Um, what we basically configured here is um, that resolve, so like a DNS lookup, is available for any package in Elasticsearch. But other lookups, or like you cannot actually load remote code from any other package except a few exceptions. So that's why Log4j wasn't allowed to actually load remote code. So it couldn't trigger the JNDI lookup because it wasn't allowed to do network calls. It could only do like set these options and do a DNS lookup, but it wouldn't actually be able to do a remote network call to, to fetch any code. Because why should your logging library actually have that permission in the first place? And that's exactly what you can do with the Java Security Manager. You can limit who can do network calls. So to figure out where you could actually do network calls, you would need to look at socket permission. We only set that in very few places, and it's only allowed to Netty, because Netty is the library that does the networking. So that's the only thing that can do a network request and fetch information. Nowhere else in the code could you fetch that information. That's why it was not a remote code execution in any version of Elasticsearch that used the Java Security Manager correctly. Um, and uh, the kind of like ironic thing was we wanted to update Log4j for a long time, but couldn't because we were running into bugs with the Java Security Manager because Log4j needed some new calls that were not allowed with our security policies, and that's why we kept the very old version of Log4j around for a long time. Um, but in the end, then we, we worked around those and we made that actually work. Um, so you could actually set that format message no lookups true, and actually, that's quite nice to see that you can do that at runtime as well. So here, for example, for this node, somewhere in here is that setting, even though I don't see it right now. But here. It's one of the many JVM settings that we set, but this is also set by default to now. And you could figure that out just by running an API request, what are your JVM settings. So it's quite nice to be sure what is set and what is not set here. Um, the other things that, or what we are doing in the build now, we are using Gradle. So what we are doing here is we are actually patching the, the log4j library, and we are just excluding the JNDI lookup class from the build. So this is how we remove that entire intact vector in Elasticsearch. Um, you can also do that on the command line. So if you're have a very old version where there are no, um, no more updates, you could just hack that together like this with a command like that, and then you can verify it with search for GNDI lookups, and if they are not there, you're good. Um, but yeah, those are hacks and not really recommended. Um, there is also a hot patch from Amazon Coretto, which would basically patch the JDK or the JVM at runtime um, and um, actually close that attack vector. Um, 
So you don't need to restart your server pro or your process, but you can just apply that at runtime. The downside is you would need to apply that every time you restart the JVM because it's only a runtime patch. So it's using some reflection. At first, it didn't work with Elasticsearch because of the Java Security Manager, but um, I was talking to those guys from Coretto, um, so Volker mostly, and they managed to fix that. So it is working with Elasticsearch. I've tried it. It is not recommended or officially tested, though, so we don't recommend it. And because we have security issues everywhere, that hot patch from Coretto um, actually had its own security issue in April. Um, so the, the security issues are never ending. Regardless of where you go or what you do, you will potentially run into new security issues. It wasn't so severe, um, but it and it was fixed very quickly, but it just shows that even the, the patch for the security issue could need another patch to actually be fully secure. Um, and what we learned was that, so we needed to set up a, like a dedicated support rotation of a couple of people who were only answering customer requests around like, what log4j version are you using? Are you vulnerable? Why are you not vulnerable? Um, and explain this to us. And we had a ton of questions around our products. Um, so coming back to the questions of, um, so let's see first if we have new questions, but there was one question I still had uh, to answer from before. So has there been any actual attack attempts using log4j that you know of? So Yes, I've seen those in our own server logs, for example, on Elastic.co and various other places, uh, or any kinds of applications that we run. Um, they didn't know the right headers, but they used or tried out random headers, so you can see the attacks. They didn't do anything, um, but they were trying out the wrong things. Also, since Elasticsearch is often used for full text search, um, putting that thing into a search box could also lead to interesting results if you were logging the search requests. Um, so that could hit you there as well. Um, so I hope this one is answered. Um, why does uh, log4j executes JNDI commands from its logs? So well, the JNDI is just the, the lookup mechanism and then the deserialization, which then happens um, through many vectors, um, is unfortunately there by default. So it's kind of like this combination of things. I, I think Brian from Sneak will always point out that this is more of a deserialization vulnerability because um, that's where the exploit actually hits you. But the JNDI is the thing that, that fetches the code. So you need those two in combination to actually hit you. And yes, unfortunately, that is enabled because JNDI just does its thing by fetching something from the internet or from the right place, because normally you wouldn't want it from the internet, but just some lookup thing. Um, but because of that bug, you could just r load remote code from the internet and, and run into that issue. Um, Logstash also uses log4j. Um, the exploit there was even more confusing because a lot of the, the libraries or plugins were packaging their own logging libraries. It was much harder to exploit it because it wasn't exposed as directly and we didn't log any requests that directly. But the library is definitely there and you needed to upgrade that as well. Also because Logstash doesn't use the Java Security Manager. So if you find a place where you actually log a header in Logstash, you would be directly vulnerable in an old enough version. But I don't think that was anywhere the case. So for Logstash, it wasn't as directly exploitable or as exposed as Elasticsearch, for example. I hope that answers that question. Um, how many releases did we do? I think we counted three. Um, so we answered that. Um, I don't think this is a valid question. Um, why did we not switch to logback? Um, I think that's... Uh, that's a more complicated question for historic reasons. I think log4j was the, the thing that was about to give you better performance, or at least that was the assumption. Um, and there's no real reason why not to use that. But I'll get to the logback versus log4j thing at the end again as well. Um, how did we search for log4j? So I mean, we have a, a BOM, the bill of material. So we have, we have a list of all the dependencies in Elasticsearch, also because of licensing checks and everything. But we have like that list of what are 
what are all the dependencies that we have in everything that we build. So we, we know those versions. What took quite some time was actually checking by the security team and they spent a great amount of effort to what is actually exploitable because it's not so simple with the combination of like the JDK version and the security manager. They did quite some digging um, to see what is actually exploitable and they also wrote some internal exploits to see how we can actually test for that. Um, so our tooling, it's not Nuclei, um, so we use something for the, I don't even know what, we, because we switched three times the tools to actually list all the dependencies, their version and their um, license, um, but it's not Nuclei, it's something else. How much does the Java Security Manager help you and how often was it a pain in the ass? Um, it was a major pain in the ass to actually build it into the product. And you could see that on GitHub um, where Robert Muir was the main person to advocate for it. And he, he spent a lot of time on that and it was a major pain and it needed a lot of refactoring in Elasticsearch. So part of the reason for that was that you need to structure your code in a way that all the things that need to do a network call need to be like put in the same package, for example, that you could lock down network access for all the other packages and only allow it from where you need it. So we spent a lot of time on structuring our code in a way that we could do stuff like, does it need access to the file system? Does it need to write something? So for example, in Elasticsearch, we also enforce that only one package that actually writes to disk can access the file system and nothing else can do file system operations. Um, so it, it needs a lot of, or it needed a lot of work to actually restructure that and we did that for version two and five. Um, we, or sorry, mostly four, five and six, but also for two already. We did a lot of restructuring and tightening down the, the rules of the Java security manager. But since then it has mostly been working and it has well, helped us a lot, but initially setting it up is a major pain. Unfortunately, there is not much point to add it to your applications anymore because it's going away and we'll need to find other tools to actually do that job. Um, okay, but keep the questions coming. Um, those are great. Last section, how can you protect against it? Um, so the the first thing that is kind of a misconception, to be exploitable, I need to use a vulnerable version in my application. That is not necessarily true because, for example, if you, if you log a specific header and you hand that over to your logger, um, or maybe your application is doing a search against Elasticsearch and then you're logging somewhere else that uh, vulnerable version, it could be in that thing that is actually logging in the background that needs to be exploitable only. So it's even if it's not directly exposed to the internet or the user, if you manage to inject something that is locked somewhere in the background, you could still trigger that exploit. So direct access to a system is not necessary for the exploit. Um, and generally, as always, sanitize your inputs. Um, and you could, for example, if your Elasticsearch cluster wouldn't need to access the internet, maybe you could even block outgoing access on the firewall level because it's really not necessary. Um, here's a nice overview of like where you could block it. So for example, your attacker sends you a bad request and your web application firewall could see like, this doesn't look like a valid request, so I'll filter that one out and block it. You could um, either update log4j or you could um, use something, some other log, logger. Um, you could disable JNDI lookups, so for like we did with the, either that setting or removing the class. Um, and you could then just tighten down where you could actually load code from and then deserialize it. So all of those would help protect against log4j. Um, and then somebody made this very nice graphic, I hope it's kind of readable, um, to see am I vulnerable to log4shell? And yeah, it is quite complex, but you start here in the top left corner, basically. Am I running code in the JVM? No. And then you need to figure out, do I have other systems in there um, that use the JVM actually? And then based on if you're using the JVM, you can figure out like, are you using log4j anywhere in your code base? Um, if yes, which major version? If one, um, one by the way has its own security issues, but they're not as severe. Um, and then only if you are 
on version 2 of Log4j, then you would be really vulnerable. Then you need to check the Java version on which you're running, and then you can actually figure out how vulnerable you are. So you need to run through this entire chart to know how vulnerable you are to Log4Shell. Um, a lot of companies especially were not or were a bit lazy and just wrote to their vendors and said, like, are you vulnerable and tell us if yes. Um, which led to very funny tweets like this one. I'm not sure if anybody has seen that, but the author of Curl, um, Daniel Stenberg, um, what language is Curl written in? Anybody knows? Plain old C. So not a JVM thing, so it definitely that has nothing to do with Log4Shell. Yet, open source users who didn't pay him anything sent him a request and said, like, within 24 hours, you need to fill out this form to tell us if you're vulnerable to log for shell. Um, which is, of course, ironic that a large organization using something for free requires somebody else to give them the information, even though they should just know that this is not actually vulnerable. Um, so there was a lot of confusion and panic around that, which didn't help the overall situation. Um, and then, not sure if anybody has seen the drama around Log4j1. Does anybody know the, the backstory of that? So the, the Java logging ecosystem is actually super small. There is one guy, Siki, who has written Log4j1, Logback, SLF4j. He has done all these three. However, he does not get along with the group that lo wrote Log4j2, which always leads to some kind of struggle. And they voted that Log4j1, even though it, doesn't, it has a security issue, um, is not under maintenance anymore, so there was no release anymore. And then he forked Log4j1 into Reload4j um, and actually also publishes that. So he does now Logback, Reload4j, and SLF4j. So he does all these three security, uh, all three logging things. Um, and he always says that Log4j2 is too complex and has too many features. That's why it has all this drama around it. But there are just very few people in that Java logging ecosystem, but they have strong opinions and they sometimes don't like each other. Um, so if you're for drama on Twitter, um, you can follow along on that. And it's also kind of entertaining to some degree to see. OK. One final thing to actually mention that is interesting is if you're using tracing, and I'm using our observability tools here, so I'm using tracing, what you could see here is in the request that your application that is normally receiving requests is suddenly doing requests to the outside world. And that is normally a very bad sign if your application suddenly starts requesting code from the outside world because that's potentially the loading of a remote code execution. So this is something how you could see that in your application when it suddenly does get operations on things that you definitely shouldn't have in your application. Um, the other thing is we also have a security solution where you can see actually some processes that are running, what other processes they are starting. And when you suddenly see that you have a Java process that calls a shell, that calls another shell, and then does some wget to fetch some more code, that's normally also a very bad sign that something is wrong in your environment. So things like that can help you. So Sneak, for example, can help you to say, like, this is a vulnerable version of a dependency. Update that. It doesn't tell you much about the, the runtime of your application. This is where, for example, with observability or security solutions, you could actually get insights into what is running in your application. Um, questions on that section? Any more questions? Yes, I will share my slides. They are actually, that's a good point. I should, I'll update the slide deck, but um, under xera.net slash talks, um, there is somewhere in the many slide decks that I, that I have, this slide deck is as well. Let me find this one here. I'll, I'll add it as a question here, so everybody who has the questions open can see that. Um, Sorry for not doing that earlier. Um, how do I add a question here? I don't know. I'm one of you now, and I enter my question. Uh, so this is where the slides are. Sorry for this hack. <laughs> 
But security talks are all about hacks, so um, let's go with that. Um, so, uh, sorry, there was, I think there was another question. Um, given, the, given the complexity about the vulnerability, well, yes and no. So I think that Log4J or Log4Shell, it's, it's a straight remote code execution. So if you find the right vector, you do whatever you want. You own the system, and there is no easy way to protect against that. Um, it's just about finding it in the right piece of software, what is exposed and what is not exposed. If you find in some popular system that they use log4j and they log something, um, some specific header, then you found almost a gold mine to, mine to exploit on the internet. I think that there will be a very long tail of like enterprise applications that don't get updated frequently, that attackers will find at some point, check for log4shell and then take over that system. And I think it's, it's like the struts vulnerabilities which have been out there for a long time, which have been lurking and everybody thought, well, these are bad, but well, hopefully everybody updated. That systems that have not been updated and that are found at some later point will then be exploited um, in a bad way. Um, so I'm afraid that's the, or that's my assumption that, yeah, it is bad. It's not like a worm or anything that is automated, um, but it gives you a big attack vector that somebody will find at some point. Um, so to wrap up, um, it is a mess for sure. Um, and it's probably lurking somewhere in your code, but it's well. How bad it is really depends on how quickly you update. And for the four vulnerabilities, the first one was really bad. The three other ones were more follow-ups and minor things in comparison. So if you patch the first one, patch all four. But the first one you really should. The other three are more like noise and confusion around the bigger thing. Um, yeah. And that is what most people look like, including us, after upgrading for Log4Shell um, three times. Um, at Christmas of 2021. Um, like I said, easy to exploit in theory. In practice, it really depends. Um, but I wouldn't rely on somebody taking some time to find that. Um, and to close out, there are a couple of things where I think you shouldn't be too smart here. The first thing is, if you don't have any logging, you're not vulnerable anymore, right? So just disable all your logging. Um, which might not be the right thing. So for example, in Elasticsearch, what you could do, you could, through the, the API, you could just disable any logging, and then you don't have that issue anymore. However, the logs are there for a reason. If the server doesn't start anymore, or if you have any other issues, you probably still want to see those logs. So that's something I don't really recommend. But I had people ask me, like, isn't this the, the best solution to this vulnerability? Just don't log anymore. I'm not sure. The other thing is um, that I've seen is that people just YOLO it in external software, where they just replace the log for J jar. And for example, with Elasticsearch, this doesn't work at all because of the security manager, or the, we have some startup checks. So it, it could fail with a startup error, it could die with the security manager error, or it might work, but we haven't tested it and really don't recommend it. Um, do a proper upgrade and don't just YOLO update your jars, because that will probably in the middle of the night hit you somewhere when you do a random call that didn't just work with that. Um, and that's it. I think we have like one minute left if there are any final questions. Otherwise, OK, great for keep going. Um, I mean, yeah, that we could have a longer discussion about Jindy and if it should even be in Java, because I feel like, who is using Jindy in general? Yeah, right. So it's one of these features that has been there forever, and we seem to kind of like keep around. Um, and it might have specific use cases, but like the attack vector that it opens up is kind of large for that. And like I shown initially in that Black Hat talk from 2016, people looked at it and already thought, well, this, this looks fishy. Um, but well, so far we kept it. And if your logger should actually be doing that is a different discussion. Um, How do you stay up to date on all security issues and all libraries and tools you use? Um, I mean, for my own stuff, I use Dependabot or whatever GitHub is then offering um, to tell you about updates and then we just apply those. So for example, we, we have internal applications that were using Log4J2 and we updated them very quickly because of that. 
Um, for external vendors, um, you will need to follow their security advisories, I'm afraid, because you probably don't know all the dependencies they have and you will just need to wait for them to release the, the advisory to tell you what to do. So for me, at least, it's Dependabot for my own stuff and for external stuff, the security list or whatever they provide for the tools that you have in use. And with that, we're exactly out of time. Thanks a lot for joining. Enjoy lunch. If you want stickers, there are still stickers here. If you have even more questions, come to me. I'm around for the rest of the day. Thanks a lot.